Hi, I'm Tom Burgess and welcome to the Weekly Wake Up, part of the Real Agenda Network of Podcasts for Political Change. And if you want to find out more of what we do here, go to our website, realagendaradio.org. Now, this show is sponsored by Reverse Media Group, one of the fastest growing search and media companies. Find out why at reversemediagroup.com. Now, today we're going to be talking about the working poor. We're also going to be talking about elitist Britain, as well as a high court challenge to the government. So we'll get each member of our team to introduce a topical news event and which we'll have a chat about. And the particular focus with the real agenda is what the problems are and how can we fix it. But let me first introduce you to the team. Hi Satya, how are you doing? Fresh from New York and I'm really pleased that you bought some new biscuits. <laughs> Special gluten-free ones at that, well done. Hi Tom, yes, always gluten-free healthy biscuits, if but, there's such a thing. But they weren't actually from New York, they were from Waitrose. Are we supposed to, uh, can we advertise? <laughs> <laughs> you, can say, you can say what you like. <laughs> well, it could have been from Sainsbury's if you've come past the Sainsbury's on, the, on, the, on your way here, but you happen to go past Waitrose. <laughs> but anyway, enough of that. So what are you going to talk about today, Satya? Tom, I'm going to be talking about the working poor today, where people, very hardworking people are living on the bread line. So we'll talk a bit more about that bit later on. OK. And we've got Hugh, our rugby correspondent. We did say our man from Brussels, but we've since found out he's a rugby international. So you actually did play rugby for a particular country, did you? I, I played for a small country called Belgium a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, good. Yeah. And you beat the French, did you? I d no. Oh, you didn't beat them. <laughs> you played against them. Played against them three times, didn't beat them once. Oh, well, you uh, survived. Well, well done. That, that's really good to know. Hugh, what are you going to uh, introduce to us to talk about today? So I'm going to talk about the three families who have taken the government to the High Court over a lack of council funding, people with special needs. OK, well, well that'll be coming up shortly. And then lastly, we've got Oliver, and he's last because his surname begins with W. Oliver, what do you want to talk to us about today? Well, I'm going to talk about a recent report or study that's been released by the Social Mobility Commission in conjunction with the Sutton Trust. And they're sort of highlighting key findings from elitist Britain and where people are educated and who's in the positions of power in the UK. OK, thanks very much. Well, that's all coming up very soon. What uh, I thought I'd uh, talk to you about and going on in the last week or so with here on the Real Agenda. We've done some, lined up some very interesting interviews which will be going out shortly. Uh, one with Vanda, the Executive Director of the Equality Trust. Um, I had a good chat with Vanda this week. And she's actually speaking in Geneva this week on the uh, poverty in the UK, human rights under threat, which is the launch of the Philip Alston support and a report. Um, from the UN, and she'll also be there with the guys from Just Fair UK. So uh, coming up, we've soon we've got the oh we did a couple of other actually interesting interviews. One on um, new economics, and also a damaged democracy, which will make some very interesting future episodes of the Real Agenda. We, and next week, there's the Tax Justice Network. I've got a two day conference in London, and that's an international uh, view on tax tax havens and all those bad things that go with it and how we need tax reform. Interesting enough, also in the same week, the Fair Tax Mark that did an event at the House of Commons last week as an sort of introduction to Fair Tax Week have got their half-day conference, which should be also make interesting conversations. So that's what's got coming up in the next week, which we at The Real Agenda will be involved with. And there is much more. But let's get on with the show and let's get talking. And first up, Satya. Well, I've got this article that was in The Guardian and they're talking about um, a, a report that's come out and there's and this report says that 500,000 people, that's half a million British workers, are living in poverty. These are people who work every day, work hard, and yet they cannot make ends meet. Uh, and it says that the number of people with jobs who are living in poverty is growing faster now than the employment rate. One, one in eight working people are now classified as the working poor you know it has a knock-on effect so it's not just adults it's then it has an effect on children last time we talked about children living in poverty of obviously they're part of these families so it says more and more parents are finding it harder and harder to earn enough money 
to pay for food, clothing, accommodation, paying for heating within their houses. You know, more and more people are having to go to food banks. This is because the wages are not indeed high enough. And Absolutely. The, you know, our minimum wage is, 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 is so low. Um, and you know it's been pushed for the living wage to go up. I mean, that's one of the things, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it is the erosion of the welfare system. It's weak uh, wage growth. You know, this thing comes back over and over again is the benefits freeze because that is having a real effect on how much pe- money that pe- these people get. Yeah. So even people who are living on low wages get a top up from the government so that they have enough money to live on. Actually, what happens is with the benefits freeze, they're just not getting enough. Wages being topped up by the government, I asked the taxpayers. So effectively, this is what's happening. We, the taxpayers, are funding companies because they're not, or we're contributing to company profits because companies are choosing not to pay their workers enough and retain the money in, in profit. Absolutely, and it's such a shame because actually we should be paying people you know, the right level of wages. I've always said a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, and that's not happening. And it is that people are stuck in jobs, low-paid jobs, zero-hours contracts, and they're just not pay- being paid enough. Just as an aside to that, it's it, I, the, the story about Julian Richer from Richer Sounds, the, the hi-fi retailer, how he's now distributing the, the ownership of the company to the people that work from the company, which he started when he was 19 and, uh, you know, he's now in his 60s. He realises that actually the wealth was created by the people in the company. I mean, he's still pretty wealthy, but, you know, at least that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and he also, he doesn't he have a John Lewis kind of... Well, that's um, what's happening. That's what, that's what it got re- yes. related to, the, the partnership. But this and is I think this is fantastic. We want more employers to do that for their people, well, to recognise, to recognise that actually the contributions that they're making. Anyone else got anything there? I mean, I, I do agree with that sort of Julian Richard approach and the John Lewis approach. Uh, it, it does require a change in the culture of corporations and it obviously has to come from the top. I mean, across you, across law, across financial services, those cultures aren't conducive to the type of John Lewis partnership. But that, I mean, I think John Lewis is so successful in his approach. We were talking about the working poor, which is where you started, wasn't it? And uh, how wages are just not enough to live off. And we well, the one thing I just wanted to point out about that, although I would never be an advocate of sort of throwing money at issues generally, but I do think in this instance where this part of society is constantly being ignored and it persists to be ignored, that, you know, it sort of shapes their views in terms of no one's listening to them and, you know, it has fueled many, I, I, won't, I will mention Brexit as such, but that's part of me. It's, it's shaping the narrative about what people think about them and now being ignored. So I think part of the issue is, or part of the solution is, supporting them then with fi- financial support, which they're not getting, and it comes back to a certain extent to, ex- to austerity. Well, it does, but I mean, the thing is, we, of course we should support, I mean, these are working poor, of course we should support them, but the tragedy is that, that the wages should be higher, that we shouldn't need to support them, if you see what I mean. Um, and there may be certain circumstances where, you know, disabled or they can't earn enough money for various reasons, or large family or whatever, but th- this is... The crazy thing. We are subsidising companies. Well, I think for so many years, the government has hidden a, behind this issue of austerity. And actually, it's, austerity is just another buzzword for cuts. And what they've done is they've cut the benefits, the help, the support, the wages for ordinary people. And they've polarised the inequality in this country that should not be happening. We don't need to do that because the, the problem is the more that we do that, the worse it is for our society and our economy on the whole. Because yeah. what it, all the reports that we've been looking at is shows that the poorer the people are, the less opportunities they get. And so the, it just a spiral down. So, the, so poorer children achieve less grades within schools therefore less have less opportunity to better jobs and it is just a ever decreasing circle and in the long run this is not good 
for our country. Right. Did, did you hear about the um, two-child policy um, on benefits? Tell us about it, Hugh. So it's a policy, uh, it's the policy of limiting welfare benefits to two children. Um, and it's ha- basically having a devastating effect on families. Um, so it's a yeah, new absolutely. report that came out um, from the Church of England and the Child Poverty Action Group that says that this policy that dates back from, I think it was April 2017, um, is totally unjust uh, and it fails to support families through the toughest of times. So, I mean, imagine, you know, a couple of years ago, you have your third child, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're really strapped for cash well, and those, those yeah. supports, those subsidies that were there for years before just aren't anymore yeah. and it's child and benefit child benefits what, what the government's done is that you only get child benefit for the first two children after that you don't get yeah, any and we've got we've got a case children. there's a case, a case we're working on in haringey of exactly that where i think there's also a disabled child in the family so there's extra pressure on that and that. Yes, it's so a, a lot of people way of reducing childbearing in this country it's it's horrendous it, it says 600 children 600,000 children are affected so far and it predicts 1.8 million will live in affected families by 2023-2024. So pushing even more people into poverty. But one of the things I think, particularly with the current current government, is that they uh, they don't fully understand that. And we did an interview here on The Real Agenda with Johnny Mercer MP. You know, I said, what about living wage, real living wage? And he said, well, I don't think really we should be interfering with what companies decide about what they pay people. Now, you know, he, he sort of believed that, but I think, that's part of the problem as well. Yeah. People think they shouldn't, but it's just wrong because it means we're topping it up and it's crazy. I mean, I think it's that's. I was flabbergasted by when politicians say we don't get involved in business and what how what wages business pays to their employees. It is absolutely the government's responsibility to ensure that our people are paid f- properly. Whose responsibility is it? It's the government's responsibility, and they should not ever shirk away from that. Just to interrupt, I do think you also have to focus on the supply side economics of of this, actually. And I think, as you say, Tom, I think you look at the companies and what taxes they're paying, what they're doing to, you know, earn profits and actually encourage them to pay more salaries rather than just looking at the government. This is what I'm saying, is the government has a responsibility to be communicating with those companies to encourage them, to help them, to support them, to pay their people a better wage. The government cannot say it's not our responsibility, we don't want to get involved. If companies aren't doing it, look at all the noise we had around minimum wage. There's so much noise, and yet when we actually put it in place, it's fine. People can do it. would Would you sort of distinguish between, I guess, companies like in the hospitality industry and the ones where, I guess, the minimum wage is quite acute as opposed to sort of the other industries? Because I, I would distinguish between that because in the hospitality industry, leisure, leisure industry, I think most definitely the government should play an extra role in other companies. For instance, I guess, banking is an example, the legal profession. I would question that because that, that means, I, to me, that's much more about enforcing re- almost regulation, bu- bureaucracy, where, to me, market forces play a more... I guess efficient role. Yeah, but I mean, the finance profession is not necessarily known for employing a lot of people at the low end of the of the of the wage scale. I mean, hospitality is. I, so think, I don't Oliver, think it matters what it yeah, is. Oliver, what we're saying is that wherever companies are not paying a fair wage and a living wage to their employees, that's where the government should be getting involved. Okay, well, we'll we'll move on. There's plenty to talk about there, and it's a very important issue, and it will we'll keep coming back back to that. So, who's up next then, Hugh? What what, what do you want us to talk about today? Well, Introduce I, your your subject, your starter for ten. So, so this is something that's um, that's quite horrible, really, um, in my mind. Uh, parents just want to be parents. I mean, at the end of the day, there's three families that are taking the government to the High Court over lack of council funding for 
people with special needs. Here, one of, one of the parents uh, representing the three families was screaming out today in front of the, the High Court, and he was just saying that parents just want to be parents. At the moment, they need to be educators, mental health specialists. They have to be paediatric nurses, campaigners, and warriors, when all they want to do is be parents like every other parent in the country. These parents simply can't cope anymore. So they, they've had to resort to going to the High Court and saying, well, we need government to act now. Um, it's all great putting you know, giving benefits to to, to families um, uh, and telling councils that they need to be helping out families more, but then the government isn't funding these um, initiatives. Uh, the Education Secretary, Damien Hines, argued that council spending on special education needs tripled in the last three years. The amount of people that are needing help has also grown massively. I think there's a key issue here, um, Hugh, and like we were talking earlier, the government has put a duty on local authorities, a legal duty to help and support people with special needs. And yet they're not actually giving them the funds that they need to fulfill to fulfill that very legal obligation. Exactly. So what are they supposed to do? It's well, I mean Damien Hines was saying that um it's going to be reviewed in the next spending review. But that's, that's absolutely fine, isn't it? I mean, just saying, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, think about it later. Another, another review. Another review. Oh, let's see after Brexit, shall we? <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. I mean, where, where's that going? Where's that going? You know, it's a human right in the Human Rights Act that, you know, particularly people with special needs need a certain level of support. In this article that I was reading with you, you is it just basically says that that is not happening. So I think the government should take themselves to court <laughs> <laughs> because they're not following their own advice. They're not following their own regulations. I think that's opening up a whole can of worms, isn't it? For them? another can of worms. You mentioned cans of worms last week, didn't we? But anyway, there are lots of can- <laughs> there's lots of cans of worms actually that need opening up and letting the worms out. I think and sorting them out. But anyway, well, moving on, it's Oliver. Um, you've got some very important things that you would like to uh, talk about today. I have. I'd like to share. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a report that's recently come out by the Sutton Trust and Social Mobility Commission. And it's really around looking at who runs our country, essentially, and it's called Elitist Britain. And the study looked at the schools and universities attended by 5,000 achievers at the top of business, politics, media, public organisations and the creative industries. And I think some of the findings won't be a surprise to many people, but if I could just highlight some and share an open discussion out. now You certainly can. Go far away. Right. One of the, the actual interesting findings actually is actually in the, in the media, it says the media alongside politics and civil service are at the top of the exclusive list with, with all three largely centred in London. But one of the interesting things because newspaper columnists who play a significant role in shaping the national conversation are drawn from a particularly small pool with 40, 44% attending independent schools and 33% coming from Oxbridge, yeah, which is quite an interesting statistic. But also actually in the, in politics, which is probably another area which is not a surprise to many, which has the highest number of, well actually this year, I mean in, in 2007 general election it returned Parliament the highest number of comprehensively educated MPs on record with 52%, which I find a bit surprising. But nonetheless, 29%. In what way surprising? Because it's not enough, you mean? Interestingly, in the House of Lords, which is, I guess, even less representative, 57% of its members were privately educated, which I guess is a surprise. No, is, is shouldn't be surprising. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was really interesting, actually, in the um, debates that they were having for the um, prime ministerial race just recently... Um, well, it's not really the Prime Minister's race. Well, the, 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 <laughs> the, conservatives, the, race? Lead, the, the, the leader of the Conservatives' <laughs> race. Yeah. Um, the, the only person who wasn't, um, who didn't go one to the, one of the elitist schools was um, Savage Javid. Yeah, Sa- Sajid Javid. Javid. Um, and uh, he went to Exeter, <laughs> which is a Red Brick University, a Russell Group University. Yes, but it's the grounding that people get. 
in in these very elite schools and the way that they debate from probably when they're four years old um, that gives them the confidence to do it and what they were saying that Jav, Sachin Javid was actually not as good as everybody else and couldn't get a word in because they thought it was partly because he hadn't been to these schools and I can actually believe that because you know when you look at those young people who come out of these very elite schools they just have a different way of behaving that's quite a interesting. different confidence yeah. actually, i'll share a little very little story actually when i was actually applying for graduate training jobs i this was after you left eton was it <laughs> <laughs> i went to a comprehensive school in the east end of london just to point out <laughs> sorry carry on Andrew. and so i was it uh applied for graduate training program at unilever actually and i was interviewed by a psychologist and he actually asked me the question, he asked me whether I felt comfortable in the, a lot of the group exercises I did, because I guess predominantly most of the people I was up against were the Oxbridge sort of contenders. And I thought I was quite surprised, I was 21 years old, uh, but uh, I guess I wasn't used to it as such. It may have came out in some of the exercises. So to your point, actually, I think at a young age, if you, unless you do drama to bring out that confidence, it does show... In a, at a later stage. So we should do debating skills at all schools and things. Absolutely, yes. absolutely, especially well, in the city schools in particular. Well, I think it is a confidence thing. I'm not saying that, you know, comprehensive or state schools don't do it, but I think it is. And actually that is, that, that is something, you know, even with like sport, it can actually give you confidence. And, yeah, absolutely. And team, team playing yeah. things. So it it's is. not just academic stuff, it's, it's team It's quite playing. interesting. In, 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 in sort of the workplaces I've worked in, I can, it's, it's, and you go into sort of presentations you can see a clear difference to the people where the school they've come from the confidence they exude as compared to people who come from the sort of the local area or in the city school it's so obvious and distinct uh, and how polished some are at a very very young age compared to others it's such. a very different kind of education yeah and these young people are brought up to believe they can be leaders they can do this and they're just basically groomed for those top jobs what i find disappointing is when people feel entitled so it's like the sort of um, you know gen speaking generally the eaton types or the, that fluffy haired guy with the the blonde hair that keeps peeing on television, you know, it's sort of this feeling of entitlement. <laughs> I don't like to mention certain names. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't that's know, it. I do want to buy it. It's on a, on a, on Boris Johnson off the list oh, okay. as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just another statistics I want to point out from the report, which uh, our rugby specialist could opine on, is uh, it says while 5% of men's football international players attended independent schools, 37% of rugby internationals and 43% of the England cricket team had done so which is quite an interesting set of statistics, isn't it, Hugh? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's no real surprise, is it? I, I didn't come from a, a public school. I grew up in a... Well, oh, I always get this wrong. Brussels. Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in Brussels, as you might have heard. Um, <laughs> is but, Hugh but elitist? In, 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 no, that's the whole point, is, is that I didn't come from an elitist school because actually in Brussels there aren't that many schools that are... Well, you don't have elitist schools. They're all publicly funded. But that's another thing, what you find in, in the UK, it perpetuates itself. And there was someone that made a comment the other day, like in, in the Nordic countries, like you know, a lot of the golf courses, are, they're public. You know, people just use, use them and play golf. Whereas like here, it's a sort of thing to join an expensive golf club. And in America, for that matter, it's very expensive to join the, the right golf clubs and a sort of ranking of golf clubs. Instead of you just want to play a game of golf, you can just go to a golf course. I mean, there are public courses here, but it's a sort of elitist thing that keeps keeps it going. Well, let's it? advocate for de democratising golf then in the UK. Well, you can advocate <laughs> that. That yeah. would be well, a great campaign. I'd join it. <laughs> Mike, can you play golf? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, nor can I. Well, let's think of something else. Table tennis? <laughs> Ping pong. <laughs> I'm not too actually, sure that's an elitist sport. No, it, it isn't actually. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, so, some, there some uh, some policy recommendations that I just wanted to highlight from the report, which it advocates yeah, actually. Yes. Are, Go ahead. One of them actually says that which I'm, I don't necessarily agree with all of them is about make access to internships in workplaces. It's financial barriers to entry to leading industries and professionals must be tackled by sort of encouraging unpaid internships of significant length. Uh, I do agree to a certain extent that internships should be encouraged, but then on the flip side of that, the, I, I have seen, again, in my, in my industries, nepotism does tend to creep in, in that, you know, your dad will roles going in a certain place and he'll give his son or related person 
or a job or just mm -hmm. hear about things. Yeah. So I guess that has to be controlled somehow, but it is a... It is a I, I was going to say that I don't right. agree with unpaid internships. I think internships should be paid yes. because yeah. what it does, it cuts out all the people who just cannot afford to do an unpaid yeah, job. And only those people who are from the wealthy background can actually afford to do unpaid jobs. I think that's the main point, Saki. Yeah, you're right. I think that's point. the main point. You no, know, it, you've, got, you've got to pay them. Sorry, Hugh, you that, want to say something? A, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right on that one. My, my wife uh, studied history of art um, at Goldsmiths University. She came from a very good academic background prior to this. She just wanted to do arts. Uh, she had a love for arts and she, she's just an artistic soul. Which is one of the things I absolutely love about her. Oh, okay. Come on then. Anything um, else you love about her? <laughs> <laughs> How often do you get breakfast in bed? <laughs> well, I, I make the breakfast and uh, she'll testify to that. Um, okay, when that's she, it. When, time's up. <laughs> when, when, she, when she finished university, she wanted to work f in, an auction, uh, in an auction. She, she went and she applied to, to all the big auctioneer, all, all the big auction houses. They, they interviewed her and fantastic. They said, okay, well, you, you can do this. But then she was offered a role and it was unpaid. And she just thought, there's absolutely no way I can live in London in, in an unpaid role. So she, she ended up not being able to do what she really, really wanted to do. And I do think that if you are doing work in any shape or form, it should be remunerated fairly. Absolutely. And free internships are everywhere you know you hear a lot about them in loads of companies and they're great ways of getting young people to do jobs that some of the staff just don't want to do and that needs to be nipped in the bud as well because if you're paying staff to to do a job you're going to expect them to do something that's worthwhile not just go and get coffees and stuff Absolutely, like that so yeah. I, I think that's you know if you start paying people they're going to have a feeling of worth as well Okay, well, it's nearly time for the end of the show. But uh, anyone else got anything else to talk about today? Oh, right, yes. Oh, Satya wants more recommendations, Tom. <laughs> I feel I have to oblige. <laughs> Give us more recommendations. Well, no, there's just one, actually, which I've heard about for quite a while, that employers should adopt contextual recruitment practices. So I'm not sure if anyone's aware of what this is, but basically it's where you take into account an individual's socioeconomic background when you're interviewing people. I'm not sure how that works in reality, but it, it's, I think it's a strong contender for sort of opening the playing field and levelling the playing field in terms of sort of equality, essentially. And any other recommendations Ooh. that you're going to bring in your new government, Oliver? I think that, there was, was one. That, well, Satya, which, what was there, you, you had well, something to add. I was just, just one about blind interviews, for example. You know, it's, there's lots of people that I know from different ethnic backgrounds who say that I don't want to put my name on my CV because actually if I have a different name, I won't get recruited or I won't even get a look in. And so it's. I just wanted to say this, that funnily enough, um, when I was driving up here, there was um, the editor of The Spectator was on and they were talking about recruitment and how they recruit and how do they recruit in terms of equality and what they said they've started to do is they actually don't want any CVs. They don't want um, any covering letters. They just do an aptitude test. So all you do is go online, you do your aptitude test, and you don't have any names on it or names, ages, gender, nothing. And they just see the outcome of the aptitude test. And that's what the interview stage is based on. That's that's fun. And how, that's how's fantastic. that working then? Did they say how? They've said it works really well. And one of the people that they've actually recently recruited was a young barman. He worked as a barman, and he, he went to one of their um, events. And he was a barman at one of their events, and saw it, and thought, "I'd really love to apply for this." Did the aptitude test, passed it, and he's now working for them. It's it's not surprising that that. I really think that companies should be going down that path. It's a fantastic way to go down it. I Personally, I, I've had experience. I, I've seen it in front of me. So when, when I was working in Brussels, I, I worked for an energy company. I'm not going to name it. I, I was working in the marketing department with a head of marketing. He was looking at names and he was flicking through CVs. And it was something that deeply, deeply disturbed me when he was looking at names that weren't necessarily Caucasian and 
flipping through them. Now, you know, I'm not saying that that's not happening everywhere. And thank God it's not happening everywhere. Slowly but surely. Exactly. Okay. Well, that just about wraps things up and uh, for, for today's shows. And thank you very much indeed for everybody's contribution. I just wanted to give a little bit of a news item before we go. Um, this is some research from the organisation Compassion in Politics. And uh, they found out that four out of five voters express real concerns about the division in politics. Four out of five voters think politics politics does not serve their interests and priorities need to change. Uh, the research showed that the support for a compassionate, a compassionate next prime minister, well, with more than two thirds thinking society should be judged on the way it treats those who have the least. A vast majority, 86%, also believe that there should be a safety net for those who fall on hard times with support for the welfare state rising with age. Did anyone want to add on that little I, comment before we yeah, go? I mean, I, I think one of the words that isn't being used enough is empathy. Uh, I think we need a lot more politicians who show empathy, not just talk about empathy, but show it, because it's all about compassion, isn't it? And it's absolutely right, and that's, that's a, a, the, hopefully the direction, you know, that uh, things will be going with and we'll get a slight shift in things. But that's about all we've got time for. Actually, when I, just on that, when I did my original training years ago with the BBC, they said, always don't say that's enough. But <laughs> that's about all we've got time for because it showed a badly planned show. But Are you telling us to shut up? No, <laughs> but I, well, I've got the clock in front of me and I know that the time's up. You can't see the clock here, but uh, it is about all we've got time for. So I just wanted to thank everybody for listening. Uh, you're listening to the weekly wake up from the Real Agenda, and we'll hopefully be back next week. If you want to follow us, you know, look up uh, online. It's the Real Agenda, sorry, realagendaradio.org. Lots of exciting things coming up uh, with more interviews and programs, and we'll be hopefully be back next week, as I said. So we'll just say goodbye from everybody. <laughs> say goodbye, Satya. <laughs> yeah, it's Satya. Goodbye from me then, and goodbye from him. It's goodbye from Oliver. Au revoir from Hugh. Au revoir, hey, au revoir. From Brussels, it's very <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed for listening to the weekly wake up from the Real Agenda. As I said before, we'll be back next week. And it's goodbye from all of us here in our sunny studio somewhere in London. <laughs> <laughs>